I'd like to introduce Scott Garcia from Smith Brothers Insurance. He's going to uh, chat and uh, discuss a little bit about uh, cyber risk coverage uh, for small businesses, what should what you should have uh, for insurance protections for your business, uh, what components are the most valuable, what things you should evaluate uh, in your current policies, and if you don't have it, what, what things uh, to ask uh, for when you're evaluating insurance coverage for your business. So, Scott? Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm Scott Garcia, I work with uh, Smith Brothers Insurance, and really what my job is is to protect law firms uh, from a risk management standpoint. And one of the largest exposures to a law firm is cyber. Um, the law firms are a huge target, um, the reason being is they have all the information the criminals are looking for. They have the criminal, or they have the financial, the personal identifiable, they have health information, they have murder acquisition information, they have corporate information, depending on what type of law firm uh, they are. So coming out of that, um, what I do is I help law firms and other organizations really manage this risk. And basically what we use are um, standard risk management techniques as well. And one of the most common uh, problems that I run into, into an organization is um, they delegate this down to IT. They said, you know what, this is cyber. I don't know anything about cyber. I'm going to have my IT guys take care of this and they delegate it down, which is the biggest mistake that an organization can do. Because when the attorney general comes in after the breach, the first thing they're going to ask you is, what did you do in order to prevent this known threat to your organization? And if you say, you know what, my IT guy, man, it's not going to go over very well. So this really needs to be addressed from the top. Whether you're a sole proprietor, you have a board, um, however your structure is, you have to come from the top and it has to be driven downwards. It really is not just an IT exposure, it's a business exposure. Um, and you have to use the enterprise risk management as well. So you really, um, having your IT guy do this entire process for you, is really just departmentalizing the risk management, you really have to go from an IT perspective. It's just using the standard risk management tools that you'd use uh, for any other exposure or risk to your business. It's mitigating the risk, uh, transferring it, accepting the risk, or avoiding it altogether. So when I walk into an organization, the first thing that I ask is, who in your organization is responsible for cybersecurity? This usually gives you a really good baseline on how well they've thought this uh, risk or an exposure to their organization. Now, they say, you know what, my IT guy, my IT guy has it, then I know we have a lot of work that we have to do, right? Um, if they say, you know what, we have a CIO in place or we have a CISO or something along those lines, I know that they've really started to address this and that they're, um, they're gonna be a little bit easier to handle it from a risk management standpoint. So what I do is I go in and I help them build the walls. And um, there's several walls that you wanna build and you wanna build as many walls as you can between the criminals and your organization. The first wall is the physical wall. Because data isn't just electronic, right? We always think, well, that's cyber, it's electronic. But in reality, as much as they keep telling us, I don't know who they are, but we're gonna become a paperless society. I probably use more paper now than I've ever had in the past. Right, so data isn't just electronic, but it's also in the physical state as well. It's papers, documents, um, those types of things. So creating that physical wall is how do I secure my data? Do I lock it up in the file cabinets? Do I have, um, or lock my office at night when I leave it? Do I have that clean desk policy that we talked about a little bit earlier? Um, you know, if the janitor does come in, all that data is, is there for the uh, taking. And then locking the server room. Um, we heard previously that, you know, to walk right into that server room, which is amazing that you can just do that, but it's so easy to do it to any company, you just wear a tech shirt. And it pretty much lets you have full access to that. The second wall is the, uh, IT wall, and we have great IT folks here today, and they can help you out with that um, because it's really a specialty, and you can really go crazy with the antivirus, the firewalls, uh, doing pen testing, whether it be physical pen, the IT, the social engineering, data log watching, backups, encryption, etc. I mean, IT goes on and on. You can really go crazy from an IT perspective, but you have to keep in mind that that's just one of your walls. That's a cog in your defense, but um, it's a very important one as well. The next wall, it, which I think is probably the most important and probably should be your thickest wall, is policies and procedures. And just putting these policies and procedures, and I'm most cautious with the word policy, um, only because from a legal perspective, when it becomes a policy, it's held at a higher standard. So I like to 
call them procedures, um, if you can. Um, one of the most important policies or procedures to have in place is the data information security policy. And really what this is, is taking a holistic view of the data in your relationship as an organization with the data. How do we gather it? Does it come in by email? Does it come in by files? Does it come in by snail mail? How do we accumulate all this information? What type of information are we accumulating? Is it health information? Is it personal information? What, what are we collecting? And then how does it flow through the organization? I mean, who has access to it? Does everybody need access to it? Or do we need to limit access to it? You know, financial documents, is it only going to be in the financial department? And then where does it flow? Does it go outside? Does it go up to a cloud provider? What vendors have access to our information as well? And how long do we hold on to that data? Obviously, the longer we hold on to it, the larger our exposure is. So do we have policies in place for part of the information security policy is, you know what? We're only obligated to hold it for seven years. So I'm only going to hold it for seven, and I'm going to have a process to start to destroy that information. And that's the last piece is how do we destroy it? Are we shedding, shredding our um, physical documents? When computers and printers leave our premises, how do we handle those hard drives? Because they all have latent images on them that has that information that can easily be obtained on it as well. So that data information um, security policy really gives you that holistic, and you after writing that policy and going through that process, you'll have a really good understanding of your interaction, your relationship with the data that's within your organization. The second thing is to review your contracts. Any contract that you have with third parties, whether it be your IT provider, um, it could be your cleaning folks, any of your vendors, read the language in there to see where that liability finger points. Chances are you're gonna find that that liability finger points right back at you, which is fine, but you just wanna know that that's, that's what the case is. Ultimately, whoever collects the data is responsible for the information. You can transfer that off in any contract, that's great because that gets it off of your chest. But chances are, read those contracts, see where that liability came to points. I find that most organizations don't actually read those contracts um, intently enough. Next one is what we talked about earlier, the incident response plan. Um, I always describe this as the fire drill. You know, if there's a fire, the fire's been around for a long time, we know what to do. You know, there's fire in the building, we get out, call 911, fire trucks come, they put out the fire, call the insurance guy, the adjusters come out. We know how to recover, we have a process so that we can respond and get back to uh, business as usual. But if there's a data breach, we can't call 911. They really don't care, right? So who do we call? And what is that recovery process so that we can um, recover very quickly and efficiently so we're not focused on the breach and we're focused on our business? Um, that incident response plan needs to be drawn out. It, it has to make sense and it has to be practical. It can't be fancy. I see a lot of times, especially with law offices, they like to add all the extra verbiage that's in there. Incident response plan is only going to be effective if it makes sense to you. So um, those two um, plans, procedures are most important. Data information security policy and that incident response plan. Having a strong password policy is also critical. There's a great book out there called Hacked Again. It's written by Scott Schwarber. He's, um, he owns a wireless, is it a wireless data protection company, something like that. Um, but his biggest um, preach that he always preaches to all the the things, and he's always a go-to guy to CNN and all the news organizations go to when there's a data breach, is he preaches passwords. And passwords is one of the easiest policies or changes that you can make within an organization. And it still amazes me that when you go into these, and you know, I'm sure the hackers can um, attest to this, that when you do pull this information off the black web, it's still amazing that password 1234 is probably still the most popular password that's out there. And passwords don't have to be all that complicated. In fact, if you overcomplicate them, you usually find a way to get around that system. Usually, you know, you got a capital, it has to be 10 letters long, special character numbers, all this. Right, we got frustrated, we can't remember if we sticky note it and we just throw it on a monitor, right? And that's usually what happens. Um, his recommendation is make them long, make it a sentence. You know, kind of what um, you alluded to earlier, you know, the ugly fox jumped over the moon or something like that. It's nice and long, something that you can remember, um, but it, it's still secure in those um, instances. The next one is the mobile device policy. Mobile device is one of the easiest ways to lose your information. Laptops, some little tablets, thumb drives, anything that's mobile, anything that you're moving that data around and you're responsible for, it's extremely easy to lose that data from something being stolen or lost. Um, it's funny, I always think about, um, there was an incident, a guy that I used to work with, he was meeting one of his clients 
and it was at the Hartford Board of Education, which is over at the old Chief Fox building now. And there were no lot, and it's that beautiful lot that's there, and he just set it down on his, it was actually his iPad. He set it down on the table, and you know, they're conversing, they're talking, he turns around, and it's not, right? So all, all the panic just sets in. Um, he actually knows quite a few guys in the Hartford Police Department, gets them right on the phone and says, hey, my, my iPad just got stolen. You know, so they jumped onto the other one and they had that find my iPhone, or find my iPhone. Anybody ever use that app? So they saw it and it, and it went to Constitution Plaza and then all of a sudden it went offline. So um, about 30 minutes later, it pops back up and it's traveling down Farmington. They can see it traveling down Farmington now. Right? The police pulls behind it, it was on a bus. And the police pulls the bus over and they get onto the bus and, um, you know, the police are walking down and they just see this kid's face just <laughs> drop white. And they go, you got an iPad? And he's like, yeah, I just bought this thing on a Constitution. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Poor kid, but, you know, luckily enough, they were able to retrieve that. But, you know, in most cases, that's not really the case. So our mobile devices are really one of our um, strongest weaknesses. And with security, in general, um, the more convenient something is, the less secure it is. So the security is, tends to be the polar opposite of efficiency. The more security we put in a place, the less efficient we become. So it's really finding your comfort zone, where your line um, in the sand is. And then um, the way that we're seeing legislation going is you really need to have the cybersecurity role defined within your organization, even if you outsource it to somebody, but just have um, somebody that is responsible in your organization to be addressing this risk and knowing how your company it, comfort level is, the security level is, with cyber uh, information. The next wall is training and culture. And again, you, know, you can't talk enough about this because it's so important and it's something that you can do as an organization. It's, it, it's something that you have control over and it's creating that culture within your organization Unfortunately, it's, it, it's, it's not a comfortable one where you know, you're almost being um, you know, cautious or questioning everything that happens. And, and you know, it's against our natural desire that we want to help people, but now we have to start to question. And social engineering is one of these things that is just on the rise, because what you're starting to find out, and what social engineering is, is it's them conning you out of the information. And it's on the rise because what they're finding, or what the criminals are finding, is it's much easier to call you and ask you for that information than it is to hack into your computer and take it from you. And we've seen, I don't know how many municipalities get hit with the W-2 scams and the CEO scams that we actually talked about earlier today. You know, these are things that we're giving them the information to pull it off. And especially right now during uh, tax season, right, the, the consumers are really the target for this thing with the, you know, Give me your tax information, W-2 on the IRS. They, they use all these tactics. Um, but this is on a rise because it's so much easier just to call you, call you out of the information than it is to actually hack in, even though hacking in is still pretty easy. Um, testing your um, employees as well. Um, it, it just brings awareness to it. And you know, you can hire a firm that does it. You can even do it internally. You know, you create a dummy Gmail account and you send them a goofy link. You know, hey, this person's pants fell off and they jumped this fence. You know, click here, right? And it's you know, walk around the organization, and ask, hey, did you guys see that video? And see who agrees with you, right? You know, who clicked on that link? You know, it could be something that simple. You know, but and then you call them out on it too. Say, hey, you know what? That was a test. I wanted to see. You know, that was a fishy email. You know. That way, they're always got that thought in their mind when that next link comes, you know, hey, wait a minute, is he trying to trick me again? You know, I'm not falling for it this time, hey, right, right? Good try. But at least it brings that awareness, and we're thinking about it, and we have that suspicion to question, you know, and just question, do I need to click on this? Um, just yesterday, as a matter of fact, I got an email from the law office, right, because I deal with a lot of law offices, and they sent me closing documents, right? Which, you know, if you're another law office and you get it, it's pretty common. But for an insurance guy to get close the dog, you know, something suspicious, you know. So what they did is they got a hold of this whole contact list and they um, they sent, you know, this this email waiting for somebody to come to You know, I don't know what the actual result was. It could be they were launching that war, they could have been trying to pull off some sort of wire scheme a scam or something like that, you know. So um, I emailed the, the attorney and said, you know, hey, I received this email. You need to get somebody to come in. Somebody is in your computer system, we need to flush them out. You need to get forensics in there. But it's it's really just testing your 
employees and really creating that culture of suspicious or just be cautiousness. Explain to them that they're part of the defense because they're the biggest weakness, quite honestly. Right? They're the ones that are clicking on things. 90% of the malware is launched in from us clicking on something. So if you make them known and, and make them part of the defense, um, you're more often to get the buy-in. Teach them how to recognize an attack. What looks suspicious? Um, there's many different things. Um, specifically, that one earlier today, what they use is urgency. You gotta do this by noon. It's a deadline, right? We, we've all got the, um, the prints in his lottery ticket, right? You gotta cash that thing in by one o'clock, otherwise it's gonna expire. You know, there's always urgency. There's different things that you can look for to help recognize what, what is suspicious. And then just teaching the importance of password security as well. The, um, the last wall is the insurance wall. So if they crash through all those walls and get through all of your defenses, you want an insurance policy that's in a place to hopefully capture you so that it doesn't sink a business. A typical cyber breach starts at about half a million, uh, depending on um, how severe the breach is, and it starts to ex escalate pretty quickly from there. Um, with cyber being a newer exposure that's out there, the insurance industry I don't think has a really good arms around um, what the severity is, and, and I think they're up for a wide, wide-eyed incident that's going to happen to them. Um, so I think everything right now is actually underpriced. But all of the um, policies are not created equal. So if you go to the Travelers, you go to the Harvard, you go to the Chubbs, you go to the Liberties, each one of them will have a different version. There's no standardization within a cyber policy. So you can see these huge swings in coverages, and some are more off to take on a larger exposure, and some really tighten that thing down, and they just are unwilling to take on much exposure. So really going through your policy to make sure that it's covering your exposure is uh, key. They're ever-changing. They're trying to keep up and ahead. Um, there's probably four carriers out there that are kind of leading the pack, and everybody's following them. Um, but they're changing as that exposure changes. It should be a standalone policy as well. And I can't emphasize this enough, because one of the common mistakes I see is, I've got a business owner's policy and it's got cyber protection, I'm good, got it. Well, all of a sudden a breach happens and you find out that that um, endorsement that's on your bond policy is probably 25,000, right? That's not even gonna cover your forensic costs. Forensics probably starts at about 100,000 just to come in here and determine what's going on, right? Just for them to walk through the door. And you'll find that those endorsements are extremely limited. It might only be third party where I'm gonna cover notification and credit monitoring so I never recommend an endorsement on their policy. Make sure it's a standalone policy. In this way, you can also customize it to your exposure. So going through all those other walls, by the time you got through all those walls, and now you're starting to address the insurance wall, and that's what I walk my clients through, is now you have a really good understanding, what is my exposure, right? You know, I might minimize this exposure so that I feel really comfortable with it, and I'm not even gonna transfer it off to an insurance product. Or, at the end, you say, you know what, I do have a large exposure here, but I have controlled it very well. And, that, and the policy that I need needs to cover this. So let's say I'm a hospitality, right? Hospitality, their biggest thing is the PCI, because they're dealing with all these credit cards. You know, they don't really care much about health insurance or anything like that, so they don't need a policy that covers that type of information. They need a policy that's going to cover all those credit card transactions that they're doing. So you really need to make sure that the policy represents your exposure. Um, so that's building the walls. I, I wanted to touch a little bit on legislation. Um, how's my time? I'm all right. But give me about two minutes. I'm going to just breeze through this. Um, the slides are going to be available, so you can kind of review these slides. But I just want to touch upon where the legislation is he heading onto this and what to look out for in the future as well. So cyber laws are a little bit unique, and you're held accountable to the state law that your clients reside in, not the state that you're domiciled. So there's currently 48 different laws. So if you have clients that are in a lot of different states, Florida, Massachusetts, wherever the case may be, you have to be compliant with those laws if you have a breach. So being compliant can be a very difficult task. Confidential information is ever changing. Um, I think New York added emails into that. Um, PCI has their own legislation, so you need to be PCI compliant with those chips and all those types of things. The federal laws that are out there is um, Greenwich, Wiley, Homeland Security, the executive order. But the key is the focus of almost all of these laws is about being proactive and not reactive. It's really addressing this before it happens and having something in the place 
um, so that you can respond and that you can respond effectively and in the best interest of your clients. Um, I also think it's gonna be a revenue generator for the government. You know, they're always looking for those things, so I'm guessing fines and penalties are gonna start to be on the increase as well. Uh, a couple of the legislations that are going out there um, that just recently passed is if you're dealing with any um, non-classified government information, this is mostly manufacturers, you now have to be compliant with the NIST 800-171, has 14 categories of security requirements. The next one is uh, general data protection regulation, the GDPR. Um, this is if you have any clients that reside in Europe. Um, this one's gonna go into effect in May. This one's a little bit unique. Um, one, the fines can be huge, it can be 20 million euro or up to 4% of your gross revenue. But what they've added to this is the right to access your information. So you can call up anybody and say, I want to know how you're using my information. And they have to tell you. Well, I shared it with so-and-so or I'm doing this or I'm doing that. Um, the right to erase it. You can call them up and say, I don't want you to have my data anymore. You gotta get, I want you to erase it. Um, data portability, you can move it. So Europe is addressing this a little bit differently. Um, where they're giving the consumers a lot of power, or the residents a lot of power. And then uh, the last one here is uh, Mass CMR 17. Massachusetts is probably has one of the best um, regula regulations or regulatory um, pieces out there for cyber. Um, they've created a WISP, which is really just um, how to be compliant. And the interesting thing is, is if you have any clients that are in Massachusetts or live in Massachusetts, you have to be compliant by this, by the way. Um, and part of that WISP is uh, training, policies, procedures, um, it, being able to prevent um, breaches as well. So there's legislation that's happening. Um, a lot of it is industry-based um, that they're pointing it out to, but you're gonna start to see a lot um, more. I don't know if it's gonna come from a federal or from a state level. My best advice to you is be proactive. Get assign somebody this task within your organization that is addressing cybersecurity. And um, I'll cut it there in the second time. But these slides are available. If you guys want to go through them, um, please, please feel free. Any questions? A lot of information, hopeful. Uh, and I think, I think my biggest takeaway from, from that is the fact of being proactive that is exactly our recommendation to our clients and anything that we do. And the fact of having all those different layers and different walls that Scott uh, talked about and that you can't just rely, you can't just say you have uh, insurance coverage and that you're protected and that you're good. Um, you gotta have all these different layers of protections, different walls and barriers to uh, protecting your business. So thanks Scott. And uh, next up we have Matt Baldini from Baldini Lane. So obviously a common theme here, right? It's uh, proactive versus reactive. It's cheaper to be proactive than it is to be reactive. You have more control over it, and you can mitigate your risk. You can't eliminate your risk, that's impossible, right? If any, anyone tells you they can eliminate your risk, it's probably not somebody you wanna trust because it's impossible. Uh, but you certainly can mitigate. And, and part of that mitigation uh, of risk is it's a shifting of responsibility. I want to focus uh, right now, Scott specifically mentioned third-party vendor contracts, right? So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I suspect within each of your organizations, um, people have received contracts and signed them without negotiating them, and probably important contracts, right? You ask yourself, of your third-party vendors, how many of those third-party vendors have access to confidential information, to personally identifiable information? to trade secrets, how many have access to that, and to what level have you done due diligence, and, and to what extent has that due diligence made its way into the contract, right? So I'm, I'm gonna read something for you right now, it's gonna make me seem much smarter than I am, but remember, I'm reading it. Okay, it's called the parole evidence rule. So has anyone, has anyone heard of the parole evidence rule? I'm gonna read the definition. Again, it, it's, this is a trick lawyers use. We use a lot of Latin terms, we don't really even know what they mean, right? But you think we do, so we seem smarter than we are. And then terms like parole evidence. So the parole evidence rule prevents the introduction of evidence of prior or contemporaneous negotiations and agreements that contradict, modify, or vary the contractual terms of a written contract 
when the written contract is intended to be a complete and final expression of the party's agreement. What does that mean? It means if it ain't in the contract, it doesn't apply, okay? So literally, you sign off on a contract, and I'm, I'm, I'm expecting each of the contracts you enter into, you will be deemed to have been a sophisticated party entering into a commercial agreement with another sophisticated party. So if it comes to having to interpret something that has blown up, something that has gone nuclear in that relationship, like a data breach, what do you think they're gonna do? Pull out that contract and say, let's see what the party's rights are. And you're gonna say, well, wait a minute, we signed it, but they promised all of this stuff in the sales process. They promised, we did this due diligence, and they said that they would do this, they said that they would do that. It's not in the agreement, it doesn't apply, okay? So each of you has a responsibility as you're doing that due diligence to make sure that those issues are being accurately reflected in the agreement, okay? There's an allocation of risk, right? I suspect any good vendor, and it doesn't mean that they're, they're trying to get one passed, but the agreement that they present to you, probably most of the risk is going to be on you, and it's your job to make sure that there is a proper allocation of risk. Now that doesn't mean putting all the risk back on the vendor, it means a proper allocation of risk, okay? Now there are some vendors that you're just not going to be able to negotiate with, right? Microsoft 365, if you're operating that, you're gonna, you're gonna click their terms of use and that's it. But 95% of the vendors that you're dealing with, I think that there's an assumption, hey, at least being a 10 page agreement, it looks important, there's a lot of small print there. I guess if I want the service, I have to sign off on it. Not the case. Everything is negotiable, almost everything is negotiable, okay? And it's really your responsibility to, to take that on. That's the point at which you have the ability to, to uh, mitigate that risk. It's the point where once you sign on the dotted line, you lose your leverage, right? So negotiations about leverage, the period of time in which you have the most leverage is when you're still courting one another. They want your business and they're probably willing to make many more concessions during that stage than they are after you sign the agreement, okay? So the kinds of things, and I mean the, the, the details that, that both Alex or Scott and Jeff were, were talking about, you know, the information security program, the, the details of that, you know, are, are they conducting pen testing, you know, to the extent that they are hosting your confidential information, your trade secrets, personally identifiable information. If they're hosting that, you know, what kind of security protocols do they have in place? What kind of physical security, access security, you know, vulnerability testing? Are they having independent auditors come in and audit their protocols? You know, all of that, all of that due diligence that you should be asking about up front that these guys have talked about, you know, that needs to get reflected in the agreement. Again, because nobody can guarantee security and if something blows up, you know, it's, it's great we have insurance policies that, you know, depending upon the, the scope of the coverage, you may be able to look to the carrier to say, hey, I have, I've had an incident, but to the extent that's in your general policy and it's maybe not as broad as you would hope, and maybe there's a cap of 25 grand on it, you know, you want to be able to turn to the vendor who caused it and say, hey, this is on you, right? This is your responsibility because the contract says it's your responsibility. You have to do all this stuff, right? So that, that kind of, um, you know, it, it, people get, it gets lost on a lot of people. People just like to sort of check out in that process and say, look, it's the contract. We don't have to deal with it. It's not a comfortable exercise to say, hey, you know, these 10 issues need to change or I'm not signing the agreement. You, know, you, you want to start off the relationship in, in sort of an in, uh, amicable manner, and here you are already having a little bit of confrontation because you're pushing back on the terms. You have to do it, right? So the, the clearer the responsibilities are on the contract, the less question about who is supposed to do what, the better the relationship will be. It's a little counterintuitive. You need that friction up front to understand each party's responsibilities so that you don't have any misinterpretation down the road. You know exactly what each party's responsibilities are. So just a couple of concepts that you need to be mindful of as you're looking at this stuff, and you've probably heard these terms, right? So indemnification, okay? Has everyone heard of that term, right? Basically that means if a third party vendor screws up and you get sued by a third party, some of your customers, let's say because there was an escape of personally identifiable information, 
that vendor has to step in your shoes and defend that action, dollar one, okay? You get sued, they have to step in, they have to pay for the lawyers, they have to defend to the extent that there's any resulting liability, that's on them, okay? So that's important, it's an important concept with regard to information security for sure, to the extent that part of the service deals with a vendor's intellectual property, you wanna make sure that that's included within the scope of that identification if the intellectual property is challenged, okay? Second thing would be limitation of liability, right? I'm sure everyone's heard that term. Eyes roll over when we do this. I negotiate, you know, technology agreements all day long, and I can tell you 99% of the agreements, the limitation of liability is the last issue to get resolved, okay? Easy, easy issue to understand, difficult issue to come, overcome in a negotiation, and effectively, it puts a cap on the level of damages you're able to recover in an agreement, right? So, using the, the, the insurance example, that 25, 25 grand cap, you know, which is not even gonna begin to scratch the surface of your forensic costs, right? You have a cap in your agreement, that's the amount of damages you can recover, and you can't recover anything beyond that. So if you had a $25,000 cap in your agreement, that's it, you're maxed out. So if your resulting damages are 250, 500 grand, from 2501 on is your responsibility, okay? Now that is not to say that vendors in a, in a particular contract are going to assume unlimited liability, most vendors won't. There's gotta be a proper allocation between the economic profile of the agreement and the risk profile of the agreement, right? Vendors are not insurance companies, right? And, and even if they were, there's no such thing as an insurance policy that would give you unlimited coverage. So there is a proper allocation, but I can bet that the majority of your vendor agreements, and specifically the vendors that are dealing with personally identifiable information, that the limitation of liability that they're handing, turning over to you in the contract that they present is very, very low. Very low and, and wouldn't even begin to, to address a data security in incident caused by that particular vendor, right? So it is within your rights, it is your responsibility to say, no way, this is going to cut. We need, we need a bigger cap here. We need a cap that reflects the risk that we are taking on by turning over our stuff to you. That's the business you're in. And keep in mind, you know, a lot of these vendors are going to have these policies to address these kinds of risks because nobody can guarantee it. You know, there are standards by which these vendors should operate. Um, you know, and, and that's part of your, your due diligence is making sure that they are operating by those standards. But nobody can guarantee it. But again, the, the backstop that are these insurance policies, you get these carve out for cyber policies. I mean, the coverage is, is big, it can be big, right? So, so you know, you should be asking about being named as an additional insurer, right? And that adds some additional complexity, but when you tap into that policy or get some coverage under the, that policy, it's, it's gonna bring into a whole different realm in terms of, of limiting your exposure and mitigating your risk. So that's what I got for you. This, this is a small, simple takeaway. Contracts, contracts, contracts. They need to reflect what due diligence you've done. If it's not in the contract, it doesn't matter what they told you in the sale, sales process. It doesn't apply, okay? Contracts are super, super important. Things go sideways, that's the first thing. Whatever third party you bring to, arbitrator, judge, jury, whatever, it's gonna look to, and nothing else. In fact, you won't even be able to introduce anything else. You're only gonna look at the contract, so make sure it's in there, okay? Thanks. Thank you, Matt. And I can attest, uh, it's been a, uh, Matt's firm has been a big help with us. Uh, of recent years in, in negotiating contracts with uh, third parties of ours, and it's become a much bigger component of our business. And yes, it takes time, and it's, to your point, you, you just want to sign the contract a lot of times just to get the deal uh, to happen and get business going with the, the vendor you're gonna do business with. <coughs> but doing your due diligence up front um, certainly provides a lot of uh, value and assurance on, uh, on your part to then having a great relationship with the vendor going forward. So.